Tonight's scripture reading will be from Hebrews 10, verses 11 through 18. Starting with verse 11. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. That he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he is perfected for all time, those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws upon their heart, and in their mind I will write them. He then says, In their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember them. And where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening. And we'll begin our song service with two songs of praise for our Lord and Savior. And then we'll have a prayer. And then we'll have a song of exhortation before Brother Pope brings a lesson to you. If you would, please turn to number nine in your books. And if you're confused, it's that purple thing sitting in the cubicle ahead of you. It actually has pieces of paper inside the song zone. I don't believe there's anything above my head there, so... <clears throat> Sing all four verses. Count a few more folks. I'll ask you to stand if you would as we sing this song. This song. All four verses. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hides my soul in the cloud of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hides my soul in the cloud of the rock, that shadows a darker sea
The next song we'll sing is number 100. Song number 100. Another song of praise for our Savior. After this song, we'll go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. All three verses. Let's sing together. Come thou
standing up and proclaiming the word of God even though they knew it would cost them. Sometimes it may cost us. But the Lord has no room in his army for those that are timid because he's not given us a spirit of timidity. He's given us a spirit of boldness and we need to make sure that that's the way we approach the word of God as we teach it to others. Boldness is a word that's also applied in several other contexts in the New Testament. In the fourth chapter of the book of Hebrews, beginning in verse 14, there we see it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. The high priest was very important in Old Testament worship. Not just everybody could be a high priest. You had to be from the tribe of Levi, but all Levites weren't high priests. You had to be from the priestly tribe, which was a section of the tribe of Levi that were descended from the clan of Aaron. But yet, all those who were descended from Aaron were high priests. It was something that was based on primogeniture, in which you had those who were the oldest in the line of the family would be those who would serve as the high priest and the high priest close uh, associates with those uh, attending him and the things that he had to do. High priest was someone who only once a year would enter into the Holy of Holies and there make a provision for his sins and the sins of the people before God on that most holy of days for the people of God, the day of atonement. So the high priest was somebody that everybody understood very clearly was serving as an intermediary between them and God. In a very real sense, the priests served as intermediaries between God and God. And man and the high priest served as the intermediary between the priests and God. So it was very important in Jewish thinking 
as it was outlined in the Old Testament, to realize that place that the high priest served in his function. We see here in verse 14, it says we don't have a high, we do have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Because of that, let's hold fast our confession. Because we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is tempted in all things, like as we are yet without sin. The amazing thing about Jesus Christ and his early earthly mission was the fact that he was able to come and be in a situation in which he lived the life as a human being. I think sometimes throughout the ages it has been easy for the pendulum to swing too far in one direction or the other. To think of Jesus on the one hand as too much human or to think of Jesus as too much did. He was that perfect combination of God and man. Somebody says, was he 50-50? No, I think he was 100% God. And he was 100% man, and I realize that's 200%, and that's too many. But he, we're not talking about him being diminished in his manhood or in his deity, either one. We're talking about him being able to serve as the perfect intermediary between man and God because he was God himself. And God, through Jesus Christ, reached down to mankind to give us a hand to build us and lift us up. But we see him also being someone who was tempted like we are. It's hard for us to sometimes understand Jesus having those temptations that we do. Can you imagine making it all the way through childhood, even to the age of accountability, and never sinning one time in word, thought, or deed? Can you imagine him going through puberty and not sinning at all in terms of the way he allowed his mind or his actions to proceed from things that would have come from his mind. Can you imagine somebody who makes it through the early stages of career? We know that he's listed as he's described in one occasion as the carpenter. We know that's what Joseph did for a living too. And can you imagine here as... Uh, well, technically, he's really he's, he's a fabricator is what the word means. Probably a worker in stone rather than someone who worked in wood. But he was someone who went through dealing with the people yet without sin. Imagine ourselves in all of those situations in which we have stumbled and fallen and we see Jesus showing us the way to do that without stumbling and falling. Who's able to sympathize with our weaknesses Yet he was someone who, in spite of his being tempted in all points as we are, he was without sin. We need to understand that and appreciate it and understand very seriously that in the position of mediator, we're not talking about someone who doesn't understand where we're coming from. We're talking about someone who has been where we have been. I taught Florida College for about nine years from 1992 to 2001. I was in the Bible department. But as all professors at Florida College have other responsibilities, one of my responsibilities for several of the years that I was there was to serve on the disciplinary committee. The disciplinary committee met, and certainly if there were moral infractions, we dealt with those very quickly and very severely. But many of the things that we dealt with were basically... Youthful hijinks, stupidity, things that needed to be dealt with because they violated the rules, but very often things that did not have associated with them a moral tank, a very clear right or wrong, but something that uh, often needed to be dealt with, but not necessarily dealt with by expulsion. Because of the nature of our jobs, sometimes everybody was not able to be at the committee meetings in which you would have someone tried before you. Somebody might have a class. Someone might have a uh, situation where they were out of town. And therefore, the committee, even though it might be made up of eight people, you would have at times in which we'd have to have a quorum of only five. Or there would be times in which certain people would be out of, the, out of pocket and other times when other people would be in it. It just so happened, and I, I think it's always been that way, the committee was made up seemingly about half and half between those that liked students and those that didn't. <laughs> and, uh, it was in, 
interesting, whenever you would have somebody who was going to have a trial before what they called the God Squad, that, that's not, not what it was. It was an irreverent way to describe it. But when they were going to have a trial before that, they would go to great efforts to find out the teachers that were going to be on the committee that day. And they wanted those who could sympathize with them. Maybe who had done a prank or two before, or who was in a situation that liked kids rather than those who saw absolutely no mitigating circumstance in any violation of the rules. Sometimes they would even have a teacher or an administrator or one of the staff come along and sit with them so that they might have someone who, while they couldn't speak unless called upon by the committee, could be there as someone who was sympathetic and there as kind of a support person for the trial. In 1 John, the second chapter, when it's talking to us about the situation that we're in, we're told that we're not to sin. But there is comfort in that when it tells us that in verse 1 of chapter 2, it says, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. We're talking about someone who can sympathize with us in our situation because he is someone, therefore, who is the very best advocate that we have. We don't use the word advocate very often. When it is used, it's used in a legal sense in which someone would serve as, in effect, your lawyer. Uh, the word in the original language is the word parakletos, someone who is called to your side for help. It's the same word that's used to describe the Holy Spirit and His work when Jesus is promising His apostles that He's going to send them a helper or a comforter in His absence. In 1 John 2, it's talking about Jesus Christ being that advocate, someone who we can call to our side in a legal sense for help. And the wonderful thing about that is, is the one that we are calling to our side for help is someone who can sympathize with our weaknesses, but also someone who is the son of the judge. Can you imagine any more perfect situation for us to be in for our benefit than to have him as our advocate with the Father. And as it said in verse 2, he is the propitiation for our sins. I'll tell you, most people couldn't put propitiation in a sentence. Most people can't say it three times fast. Because it's a word we rarely use in English. But it carries with it the idea of someone who has paid the fine, paid the penalty for whatever crime was done. Someone might provide in ancient times a propitiatory sacrifice so that the debt would be paid for what was done. We see that to a large extent in the sacrificial system described in Leviticus 1-10 through 10, in which we see sacrifices that were offered to uh, at least partially propitiate the sins that were committed once they were discovered by people who had, been, who had done those particular crimes. We need to understand that we, therefore, as it says in verse 16, might be able to come before the Lord, as it says in verse 16, we can draw near to Him, or come near to Him, I think the New King James Version says, with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We stand before the great judge of all the earth and will indeed do so one day with either the blood of Jesus Christ serving as the means by which our sins were paid for, with Jesus Christ, the righteous, serving as our advocate, or we stand before the Lord as it were naked with nothing to offer the Lord for the things that we have done that were wrong. No mitigating circumstance that we could provide to make it to where we can stand before God and be able to allow ourselves to have any hope of being able to be declared innocent in the final analysis. In verse 16 of Hebrews, the fourth chapter, 
It again describes how that we can do that with parousia. We talked about that word this morning, which carries with it the idea of openness, of confidence, of boldness, as some of the translations will translate the first uh, incidents of that in, in verse 16 of chapter 4. Therefore, we need to understand exactly what kind of boldness is under consideration here as described in these three verses. The first thing I want you to understand about this is the fact that the throne of grace that is described there, that we can come before with boldness, is indeed the throne of God. But I want you to realize that every time the throne of God is described, it's not necessarily described as the throne of grace. In the 89th chapter of the book of Psalms, in verse 14, I want you to notice here as it describes God's throne, it also describes some other characteristics that are not necessarily gracious or merciful. Chapter 89, beginning in verse 14. There the psalmist writes, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Loving kindness and truth go before you. Here it describes the foundation of God's throne being righteousness and justice. And you notice that doesn't necessarily involve mercy there. When we're talking about God and He in His role in the universe, providing a foundation, a standard of right throughout the ages to provide righteousness and justice for everything by which we can either determine that something is correct or not, we need to recognize very clearly that that isn't something that includes mercy. Right would certainly put us in a situation in which we'd have to declare very quickly that we haven't always done right. And justice is something that while certainly God will provide justice, we need mercy instead of just simple justice. But in the last part of that verse, you notice it says that loving kindness and truth go before you. The word loving kindness is a made up word. When they translated the Bible into English at first, there was no word that could translate the Hebrew word chesed. It's a word that means covenant love, covenant loyalty. It means doing something that is, that is kind and merciful and right, irrespective of the behavior of someone who it is being offered toward. And here we see the Lord being merciful. It describes the foundation of His throne being righteousness and justice, but it also mentions here in chapter 89 the idea of loving kindness, of God being merciful, of God loving us in spite of our unlovability. It also says in the fourth chapter of the book of Hebrews, in verse 16, that it is with confidence or boldness that we can draw near to that throne of grace that is provided. That Throne of grace is something that we can very well see as describing is described in the New Testament as being something in which God's grace, His gift is made available to us on the basis of His attitude of mercy that He's shown to us. Sometimes it's easy for us to get mercy and grace mixed up, and they are certainly related. But the attitude of mercy is something that has caused God to provide us with grace that usually implies the things associated with sending Jesus Christ as the gift for our redemption. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that any man should boast, as it says in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. God's gift is something that is provided for us at the very throne of God where we will be judged. But it is something that comes from the mercy that he chose to extend to us because of the pitiable situation that we were in. The word draw near that is describing the situation in which we can approach the throne of grace with confidence 
is something that is a, a word very akin to what's described in the 21st chapter of the book of Leviticus. Although we're talking about Greek being the language that New, the New Testament was written in, and we're talking about Hebrew being the language that for the most part the Old Testament is written in, it is no accident that we see the same type of words that are used, the same idea expressed across the cultures of these two languages. In verse 21, in verse 17 of chapter 21, I want you to notice when it talks about someone being able to be a high priest and present themselves before God, be able to come near before God, it says, beginning in verse 17, speak to Aaron, saying, No man of your offspring throughout their generations who has a defect shall approach to offer his food, the food of his God. For no one who has a defect shall approach a blind man or a lame man or he who has a disfigured face or any deformed limb or a man who has a broken foot or broken hand or a hunchback or a dwarf or one who has a defect in his eye or eczema or scabs or cut, crushed testicles. No man among the descendants of Aaron the priest who has a defect is to come near to offer the Lord's offerings by fire. Since he has a defect, he shall not come near to offer the food of his God. Now, first of all, I want you to notice that God doesn't accept junk. Now, there is no moral defect necessarily for someone being handicapped in any of these ways. But the point God is trying to get across to Moses and to Aaron is when you come before me, when you draw near to me, when you come near to me, it is going to be with the very best that you have. You're not even going to do it and offer, if you're not going to come before God with someone who has a personal defect, certainly you would think that it would make sure that they wouldn't offer animals that had physical defects. But I want you to notice back in chapter 21 how it mentions there how that someone is not to, in verse 21, defect is to come near to offer the Lord's offerings by fire. And here back in the fourth chapter of the book of Hebrews, it says, let us draw near with confidence. Can you imagine a high priest who was in a situation who may have fallen down and hurt himself in some way, or who may have developed a patch of eczema on his skin in some way, realizing that I may not be able to come before God, or coming before God with a lack of confidence, thinking, as imperfect as I am, how is the Lord going to be able to accept me? But unlike that, realize what it tells us in the New Testament, and that is that we can draw near with confidence or with boldness to the throne of grace. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to have the anxiety associated with it. Recognizing that we are imperfect, we are made perfect by the blood of Jesus Christ serving as the propitiation for our sins. And the third point I want us to make is the fact that we can do that with absolute confidence and we can do that with boldness. Boldness in the New Testament is not necessarily a negative word. A negative word. I remember when I was young, when my father used the word boldness, he was not talking about a positive quality. I can remember sometimes he would talk about a young man being especially bold. And that meant that you had someone who was too big for his bridges, who spoke when he should have spoke, who should have kept his mouth shut. And my dad, I, I remember on several occasions giving me that lecture that children are to be seen and not heard. And if a child was too bold, it was not a good quality. I've seen people on television be rather bold in the way that they talk to the president or the way that they talk to authority. And, uh, you know, whether we're talking about during the time of President Obama or we're talking about the, the, the time of President Trump, presidents are in a position in which they ought to be shown respect. I read something here a while back about protocol for coming before the Queen of England. Years ago, I went on a, I had a trip.
trip, which our tour guide was British. Her father was a doctor who had retired, and as is often the case, he was at the very end of his career allowed to come and be presented before the Queen. And they would send you a booklet that told you exactly how you were to act when you came before the Queen. You don't walk up and say, hey, Queenie, what's up? <laughs> you stand there very quietly and carefully. You speak when spoken to. You bow. You curtsy, depending on your gender. You answer questions if you are asked them, which is not too likely. And you show absolute respect even walking out of the room backwards lest you turn your back to the sovereign of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, Northern Ireland, and all the British colonies. They don't take any chances on someone not knowing that they are to treat the queen with absolute respect. So even in circumstances that we find ourselves in in this world, we're, we're talking about a situation in which boldness is not always appreciated. So therefore, how can we have the right to come before the Lord with boldness? The word boldness in the New Testament, the word for it, penicea, that we've talked about a couple of times today, is a word that characterizes the attitude that an Athenian could have had as he approached the democratic assembly of the city of Athens, which oddly enough was called the Ecclesia. Now what that meant was that if you were a free male citizen of Athens, even if you were the street sweep, in circumstances in which the city was meeting in the Ecclesia to conduct business, you could approach the rostrum with absolute benesia, with absolute confidence, with absolute boldness that you had a right to be heard. Imagine, what is it that allows us to be able to do that before the great judge of all the earth? I remember there was a friend of mine years ago who was a lawyer from a very big law firm in the town where he lived. And he was going to be presented before President Clinton. And he did not have a great deal of respect for President Clinton. I've heard him say bad things about the president. He told me that he said when he was presented before President Clinton, he was going to give President Clinton a piece of his mind. He was presented before President Clinton, and guess what he did? He shook his hand. He said, good to meet you, sir. And oddly enough, that was all of mine that he wanted to give President Clinton. <laughs> because when it came down to it, he recognized that he didn't have any right to have any boldness with him under the circumstances of him being the chief of government and the chief of state of the United States of America. We need to make sure that as we approach God, we realize how blessed we are to be able to approach the throne of grace with boldness and confidence. You know, if I were to call President Trump today, just imagine, just take my phone out of my pocket, dial up and say, listen, operator, give me the white house. I want to talk to President Trump. I have absolute confidence that I would not get through. <laughs> you know why? Because he doesn't know Curtis Pope from Adams Allfox, and he doesn't know any, he doesn't have any reason to want to talk to me. And we need to recognize that here, in spite of the fact that we are insignificant before our own government in a way, that we have to recognize certain protocols in the line and, the, and the, the, the hierarchy of respect, even in our own country. When it comes to the great judge of all the earth listening to us, we can be absolutely certain that he's going to be there. He's going to care for us. He is going to always be there when we ask for help. What if somebody called you and asked you for help? My guess is that you would help them on the basis of the relationship that you have with them. 
Let's say it like this. Why well, would help anybody? I'm not sure you would. Let's suppose somebody called you up and asked for ten thousand dollars. Well, you know, I would, I would obviously tell them you've got the wrong number to click. <laughs> uh, but that's not entirely true. I had my son or my three daughters call me up and said I need ten thousand dollars. I don't know why they'd call me asking for ten thousand dollars, but. If they were that desperate and the need was that great based on their relationship with me, I would probably do my best to come up with it. If somebody called out of the clear blue and said, I need $10,000 to be able to help my particular charity, probably they're not, going to, they're not going to be listened to by me very well. I don't have the relationship with them to be able to assess the need as I need to be able to understand it. But isn't it amazing that we can come before the throne of grace with confidence? We can draw near to it, recognizing our own imperfection and realizing that we've been made perfect by the blood of the Lamb. And recognize that the Lord cares about us in whatever situation that we're in to want to listen to us whenever we call upon Him. In fact, it is impossible for the Lord to be unconcerned about us because every request that we as Christians make of Him is filtered through the blood of Jesus Christ. What a great privilege to be able to approach the throne of God with boldness and recognize that the great judge of all of the earth hears me whenever I call. My mother lives in Bowling Green, Kentucky. We moved her there probably about two years ago. And she's, she's living in a retirement community. And we talk to each other on a regular basis. But you know, sometimes I can't even get through to my mother. Sometimes she'll be off at the dining hall eating. Or she'll be on a phone with somebody else. Isn't that terrible? Don't you hate it when you call somebody and their phone is busy and they're talking to somebody that apparently they think is more important than you? But you know I don't have to worry about that with my heavenly father because the phone's never busy. He doesn't have anything greater to do than to listen to my desires, my wants, and my needs, especially those consistent with my spiritual welfare and his eternal purpose. In fact, it's impossible for him to be unconcerned about us just as it would be impossible for us to be unconcerned about our own children. Many of you have had children who have gone off to college or in their first work situation. And it would be impossible for you to be unconcerned about what was going on with them, wouldn't it? If you found out that for some reason your child had run out of money that they had allotted for the month, and for the last two weeks of the month, they were eating ramen noodles and pork and beans. That'd probably bother you a little bit, wouldn't it? Because you'd realize that I can't be unconcerned about them. That can't be good for their health. You'd want to do something to fix it. I want you to realize that our Heavenly Father is someone that we can approach with the same kind of confidence. But I want to end with this one thought. And I want you to realize it is a thought that I don't present in any way that is intended to be insulting or intended to be insensitive. But if you are not a child of God, you cannot have such boldness. You cannot have that confidence. As I approach the Lord... I can do so. I can draw near to the throne of grace with confidence that He hears, that He cares, that He knows. And even though my answer may not always be yes, and sometimes it may be wait, I know that my Heavenly Father cares about me. And He cares about you too. But just like my listening to the requests of my children is something that I put in a greater priority than I do of anybody else who calls on me. Our Heavenly Father is exactly the same when it comes to those who approach Him who aren't His children, who haven't submitted themselves to the great judge of all of the earth and His plan for redeeming mankind. Why 
why don't you solve that problem tonight? By coming in faith and showing it through repentance, confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We can make it so that you can leave this place washed in the blood of the Lamb if you'll simply submit to, as we talked about, the watery grave of baptism so that as you submit yourself to that, you can bury the old man of sin and you can be raised to walk in unison of life. Do that so that not only will you have your sins washed away, but you'll have initiated a relationship with the Heavenly Father that was severed when you first sinned and has been restored through the blood of Jesus Christ so that you can call upon our Heavenly Father any time of the day or night and be certain that He wants to hear what you say. If you as a child of God have not allowed yourself to have the boldness that you need to have in prayer as you approach the throne of grace, please don't allow your faith to fall. Put your confidence in the Lord. Put your boldness in your, in your prayer life. And make it so that in every aspect of your life, you recognize that that relationship with God that you have is one that ought to be treasured, that ought to be valued, and is something that you ought to do everything within your power not to allow to sin because of your failure to be faithful to Him. Think about these things, and if we can help you in your obedience to the Lord this evening, we invite you to come while we stand and sing. So, oh, my Savior, Thou art me.
Tuesday evening at 7.30 and Wednesday at 7.30 to continue the fall meeting. We hope you all come back for that. The sick on the list are the same ones that I mentioned this morning. Fortunately, we have none new, but these people are in various stages of, uh, of recovery with Mike Craig, Miles Drubaker, Carol Flint, and Kanita Hall. We also want to keep in our prayers Kathy Grizzly. She's going to a very trying time. Tonight, there will be the middle and high school devotion meeting. That will be in room 12. They will be together in room 12 immediately after the services. And we've been remiss in announcing one of our new members. We want to rectify that now. I'd like to ask Sherry Moody to please stand so everyone can rec Welcome. She fit in so well, we made her a part of us. We forgot to announce that she was a new member. Glad to have you. Groups 1A and 1B. We'll meet uh, after services. And with that, would you please stand? Those that are unable to take the Lord's Supper to be prepared for you with the snakes at the back door. What's about? foundation is righteousness and justice, with loving kindness and justice going before you. You are the supreme authority and righteous judge, yet you have blessed us greatly by acting mercifully towards your undeserving creation, giving us the ability to go boldly before the throne because of the sacrifice of your son, the perfect intermediary and advocate. Thank you also for giving us the ability to come before you now in prayer as an assembly. Help us to take these lessons about boldness today that come from your word to act boldly towards those in the world who do not know your word. Thank you all. Thank you for all the wonderful blessings you've given to us and give us safe travels on our way back home. Your son's name. Amen. 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 Amen.